Hey guys, I'm Saurabh. Welcome to the channel. Today in this video, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic that is landscape photography. This video is in collaboration with one of my favorite landscape photographers, Navneet Unde Krishnan. If you're not following him on Instagram, the link is in the description. Check his Instagram for amazing landscape images. Today in this video, I'm going to cover all the tips you need to know as beginners to take your landscape photography to the next level. This video will be long, but definitely will be worth your time. So without wasting any time, let's get started. The first thing is camera gear. Talking about any genre, I feel the lenses matter more. Not that the cameras do not matter, but lenses matter more. For landscape photography, I recommend two lenses. One is a wide angle and second a telephoto zoom lens. A wide angle lens because you get that wider field of view which allows you to capture more of the landscape. The lens that I'm using is a 14 to 24 mm 2.8. I use a full frame camera so the effective focal length is 14 mm. But if you're using a crop sensor camera, I will recommend to get a lens at about 10 to 11 mm wide so the effective focal length is around 15 to 16 mm. The reason for using a telephoto lens in landscape photography is you get to zoom in and capture the smaller details of a wider landscape. I use my 7200mm a lot for landscape photography to get those tighter shots. One more gear apart from cameras and lenses that is very important in landscape photography is a tripod. When you're into landscape photography, you're going to shoot in different conditions and a good tripod is a must have. I will link some of them in the description below. Don't invest in a cheap quality tripod because a tripod is something that's going to hold and support your camera gear and accidentally if anything happens, it's going to cost you way more than a good quality tripod. The next point is camera settings. For landscape photography, I use two camera modes. One is aperture priority and second is manual mode. Let's talk about manual mode first. The first thing I decide is what aperture do I want to use. Most of the times, I want everything to be in focus so I shoot at f8 or f10. For this particular image, I shot two different images at f10 and f2.8 with the focus on the tree. And I like the f2.8 version because the grass is not in focus and personally it adds a bit of depth to the image which I like. For images like this where I want a sun star, I use a smaller aperture like f14 or f16. Smaller the aperture, more pronounced will be the sun star. There are two issues with using a smaller aperture. One, if you have dust on the sensor, it becomes more visible as you use a smaller aperture. And two, after a certain point, which is known as the sweet spot of the lens, the sharpness of the lens tends to reduce. Now, if you want to know the sweet spot of your lens, just research a bit on the internet and you will get all the information. So technically, even if at f16, you're getting more depth of field, the image won't be as sharp as it would be at f10 or f8. The other two things left is shutter speed and ISO. What to decide first? It depends on the situation. If there's some kind of motion and that motion is important, then I will adjust the shutter speed first. If the motion is not important, I'll set my ISO and then I'll set my shutter speed accordingly. While adjusting the exposure, don't rely on the display always rely on the histogram. The histogram is going to give you an accurate representation of the exposure you are about to capture. Make sure you don't overexpose the highlights because if you do that, you cannot recover them in post-processing. If you're shooting in good lighting conditions, most probably during daytime and the shutter speed is not important, you can also use aperture priority. The shutter speed will be adjusted automatically by the camera and it saves you a lot of time and you can focus more on the composition. That brings me to the next point, composition. All the basic composition rules like symmetry, rule of thirds, leading lines, everything is applicable in landscape photography. The intention behind good composition should be to keep it as simple as you can so that the viewer understand what is the main subject and it is also pleasing to the eyes. One tip to make your composition much more interesting is to use a foreground element. A foreground element adds more depth to the images but make sure it's not distracting. It's there to complement the rest of the composition and not distract you from the main subject. One more tip is to place a human element in your landscape images. The reason why this is a very good tip is one, it adds interest and two, it gives a sense of scale. Since you know the size of an average human being, you get an idea of the scale of the overall landscape. 
What I do, irrespective of the genre, is I study and analyze my favorite images from my favorite photographers. If you have seen my photo reviews video, you will get an idea of how I do it. Once you start studying and analyzing the composition of the images, you will develop a sense of good composition. Let's analyze Navnit's images for a better understanding about composition. In this image, the photographer has placed the subject on the lower left rule of thirds. If you pay attention, the chimney-like structure is also situated on the left side which is helping the composition. For the next image, as we discussed, foreground element is being used. Again, if you pay close attention, the lines of the foreground element is guiding you towards the main subject. This is known as leading lines which is a very strong composition technique. If you see this particular image, the roads are not exactly straight but the lines of the roads are guiding you towards the main subject that is the mountains. For this particular image, both leading lines and rule of thirds are being used. In this case, the water body acts as the leading lines. In this image, the mountain is symmetrical in nature, so it's placed exactly at the center. As we discussed, due to the placement of the human figure, we get an idea of how large the landscape is. This is one of my favorite landscape images. The mountain is symmetrical in shape, placed exactly at the center and a very simple composition. This image is one of the best examples on how simple compositions can look pretty amazing. The next point is planning. When it comes to landscape photography, you're dealing with nature and obviously you cannot control the climate but what you can do is plan before you go to shoot. The question is what and how should you plan for landscape photography? Well, that depends on the kind of images you're looking for. The most important thing is the weather. I check the cloud cover. If I want to shoot stars, I will prefer a low cloud cover percentage and will shoot mostly during no moon days. Wind also plays an important role. If you want to shoot calm reflections, you would prefer a less windy location. On the other hand, if you want movement in the clouds for a time lapse or a long exposure, you would prefer stronger winds. You can use Google Maps too for doing a bit of research about a particular location. I see a ton of images before going to a location to get a better idea of what could I do differently when I reach that location. Doesn't matter how much you plan, things are always not going to work out 100% the way you have planned it. But the probability of getting a good image increases when you spend extra efforts in planning your shoot. One important factor for planning is lighting. Most important thing about a photograph is light. In landscape photography, mostly we are dealing with natural light. If the light is good, it can make an ordinary location look extraordinary. If the light is not good, vice versa. Generally, I don't prefer shooting much when the light is too harsh. If the cloud cover percentage is high and it's an overcast day, the light will be softer and probably I'll shoot the whole day. My favorite time of shooting is golden hour and blue hour. These are the times where you see a lot more colors and get those dramatic images. In case of sunrise, the blue hour happens first and then the golden hour. In case of sunset, it's the exact opposite. What I would recommend is research about the timing of sunrise and sunset of a particular location and reach that location one hour prior to it. This way, you get more time to explore the location and finalize a good composition. Once you're happy with the composition, then you have to wait for the perfect light and take the image. Most of the times, the best light will only be there for few minutes or even few seconds. But since you have taken all the efforts before shooting, you're going to get a great shot. The next point is filters. Before I talk about filters, it's time to thank the sponsors of the video who made this video possible, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community. It has a lot of classes. Want to learn photography, filmmaking, editing, music, animation? Go to Skillshare. I just completed a class on travel photography by Dan Rubin. In this class, he shares his thought process of capturing a location and different types of shots essential for travel photography. He also shares his different editing workflow in this particular class. You should check out Skillshare if you want to learn and upgrade your skills. The good news for my subscribers and early viewers is for the first thousand people to click on the link in the description below, you get a free Skillshare trial membership. If you're taking a yearly subscription, monthly you're paying less than 10 US dollars or 800 Indian rupees and you get unlimited access to all the classes. If you want to check out Skillshare, the link is in the description below. Talking about filters, filters are something that you attach in front of the lens to achieve a desired effect. 
Some of the lenses also allow you to put the filter through an opening but it works in the same manner. For landscape photography, the two filters that I use is ND filter and a circular polarizer. A ND filter is a dark piece of glass. It is used for taking long exposures during daytime. ND filters come in different types. Like for example, suppose there are two ND filters, ND4 and ND8. ND4 will reduce 4 stops of light and ND8 will reduce 8 stops of light. Higher the number, darker will be the glass. For beginners, I would recommend to get a ND6 or ND10 depending on your usage. Talking about circular polarizer, this is completely different from a ND filter. Many people confuse it and they think it's the same but no, they are completely different. A circular polarizer is a filter which you can rotate and you can change the angle of the light and add or remove reflections. I have separate in-depth videos on how to use these filters. Sometimes I use the circular polarizer and ND filter simultaneously when I want the effect of both the filters. The last point is post-processing. I have seen a lot of beginners over editing the images to make their images look dramatic. The problem with that is the images lose their natural feel. If you see Navneet's images, the images are dramatic, colors are vibrant but the images are natural at the same time and that is what you have to master. I have separate in-depth videos about editing images, again the links are in the description. One of the areas which you have to pay attention while editing landscape images is the border that separates the highlights and shadows. If you over edit the images, you will see this artificial looking line which is known as halo. That's something you have to avoid. So the goal behind post processing the images is to make your images look better but also natural at the same time. That's it from this video guys. I hope you people enjoyed this video. If the video was helpful, press the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new to the channel. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Bye.